opening slide, Oracle Stretch Clusters. What I'm trying, hoping to present to you all today is Oracle's concept for zero downtime and zero data loss, which is very good indeed. But there is one major problem with it that Oracle's maximum availability architecture, as it's called, doesn't come cheap. And what I'll come to, so I'll present that first, and then towards the end of this little lecture, I'll show how it can be done with what is called Oracle Stretch Clusters. And Stretch Clusters can give you a level of fault tolerance, which in some ways is almost superior to Oracle's maximum availability architecture, in some ways, at a far, far reduced price, based indeed on standard edition. So, to begin with, I've tried to summarize here what many sites want to achieve, and you'll have to bear with me if I've missed out things, because I'm not any sort of businessman. I'm not any sort of sales droid either. You know, so I've been trying to guess largely at the business requirements. But in general, what sites will often be wanting to work towards is the concept of 100% uptime, 0% data loss. Now, this is, of course, pretty clear. 100% uptime meaning systems available all the time, uh, sessions never broken. 0% data loss, no matter what happens, there should never be any loss of committed data. Now, Oracle can do that. I have to bear, you have to bear in mind it was never possible before release 9i, but from 9i onwards, theoretically, you can get 100% uptime, zero data loss. But that's Oracle's definition of 100% uptime, which may not, in fact, be what end users perceive as 100% uptime. 0% data loss is beyond debate. No, we can certainly achieve that. The definition there being not one line of committed data will ever be lost. Uh, and users, of course, might lose an in-flight transaction, but that's a different matter. Rules of relational database, if it ain't committed, it can't exist. We can do that then, but it's expensive. So then we move on to how can we do it with minimum cost. Many sites don't like the idea of idle hardware, and Oracle's maximum availability architecture does tend to rely on the fact of machines sitting there doing nothing, which is a phrase I personally loathe and detest. But the number of times I've heard it from people on the business side is quite phenomenal. You know, this comment that you know, we've got this computer sitting here doing nothing. You know, and I try to explain it isn't doing nothing. You know, it's protecting the survival of your business. You know, but I do understand why, in many cases, people will want to bring the machines used for fault tolerance into use, bring them into use for perhaps enhancing performance or scalability of systems. So we want to reduce the possibility of having idle hardware. And in software terms, reduce the licensing requirements. And then there's other stuff. We need high performance. We need scalability, of course. So Oracle's premium product for this, maximum availability architecture, the way I tend to think of it is very simplistic. We've got three basic products, rack, data graph, streams. Now, what I'm going to assume for the next half hour or so is a reasonable degree of technical knowledge in terms of understanding of an Oracle database and an Oracle instance. You know, but if at any time, time I do assume knowledge that you don't have, you know, drop a note through to Dave and he'll pass it on to me you know, when at a suitable point. But the concept of rack of the database in the instance, as we should all know, the database persistent storage on, is persistent storage on disk. Your instance is memory structures and processes. It's transient. A typical, well, a standard single instance environment is one instance, one database, a one-to-one -one ratio, one-to-one -one relationship. With Rack, one has one database, but many open instances, many open instances on many machines. So in effect, it gives you the one-to-many. You then left with a single point of failure because you've only got the one database. Data guard reverses the situation. The data guard concept, so I'll go through these concepts later on, is many databases, many copies of the database on different sets of disks on different machines, but only one open instance is actually going, doing work. So it protects you against the single point of failure of the database, but introduces another point of failure, which is single instance. So there we have many to one. The third factor, streams. Now, I'm sure that some of you are already saying, oh, streams, ancient history, you know, nobody uses that anymore. Well, I'll, that's why I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it. So I've got a couple of slides. Streams, in some ways, gives you the highest possible level of fault tolerance. 
because it gives you the many-to-many -many relationship between databases and instances. Many databases, physical databases on different machines, many instances on different machines, and keeping them synchronized so that you can, there is no longer any single point of failure. I've then included here some of the enabling technologies just for completeness, really. ASM, Automatic Storage Management, um, I'll be talking about that towards the end of this little lecture. Um, <coughs> Oracle's solution for shared storage and high available, highly available storage and highly performing storage. I'll try to persuade some of you to use it who perhaps aren't using it. And never forget that it's suitable for single instance environments as well as distributed systems. RAID, underlying RAID technology, clearly that can be integrated into a maximum availability architecture. And I've just put down ARM, um, recovery manager, because of course backups come into this too. But it's these three that I really want to talk about. Now, beginning then with Rack. So, it's an active-active model. Well, that means multiple instances on multiple machines, both doing work. What does that give you? Well, it protects you against many of the single points of failure that affect individual single instance environments. You can lose an operating system. You can lose, why would that happen? Operating system bug, maybe. You can lose an instance or a 600 that brings down the node. Um, brings down the whole entire instance. You can lose the node for any number of reasons, power cuts, whatever. What it doesn't protect you against is disk problems, because there's only one database. It doesn't protect you against power loss, because for, as we'll see later on, typically everything is in reasonably clo close proximity to each other. It doesn't protect you against network issues. And most important of all, the site is a single point of failure. And that, of course, happens, well, losing a site happens more often than one might think. I remember, oh, I was hearing on the news saying this morning, you had an earthquake, didn't you, on the, in America only last night. I was wondering if that brought down any data centers on, in the affected states. Of course, I know you guys on the West Coast, I guess you don't get out of bed if it's less than seven on the Richter scale. But an earthquake is, of course, the most dramatic point of site failure. But there are also you know, diggers cutting through cables and so on and so forth. And RAC doesn't protect you against that. John, no. we have a quick question in the queue. I think uh, back a couple of slides actually uh, would be most relevant. Um, does Golden Gate fit into the picture here at all? Yes, it does. And I will deal with Golden Gate after, uh, when I've been through Rack and Data Guard, I'll mention Golden Gate there, but thanks for reminding me. I'll make a note to talk about it perhaps a bit longer than I'd intended to. Great, thanks. So we will be dealing with that. Now, Rack then, just a brief technical summary for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Those of you who have been administering racks for the last 10 years, just bear with me. We have multiple layers of clusters. We have a hardware cluster, operating system cluster, storage cluster, database cluster. And each layer of clustering is totally dependent on the layer that precedes it. Well, what's a hardware cluster? Minimum, two nodes, two computers. Two computers with their own CPUs, their own RAM, almost certain local storage, connected in three ways. They're connected to a public network, probably several, but for simplicity I've just drawn one public network so then users used to get to it. They're connected via a private network. In that private network, that could be, well, if it were two nodes, theoretically, it could be a pair of Ethernet cards and a crossover cable, though that would be totally unsupported. But it's a private network used for cluster communications. The third connection, shared disks, and there are a number of technologies for that. So that's your hardware cluster. Two or more nodes connected in three ways, public network, private network, shared path to disk. I've uh, set here concurrently attached to both nodes. The disks are often the hardest part to get set up correctly, by the way. They needn't be concurrently attached. You can use various forms of network attached storage, but whatever it is, they must appear to be concurrently attached, directly mounted. If it is network attached, it must react as though it were directly attached. On top of that, you build the operating system cluster. Now, the operating system cluster where this is going to get your operating systems talking to each other. Why? Access to shared facilities. Going back to the previous slide, in principle, these disks are directly attached to both machines. And there's no intelligence down here, no brains at all. So if this machine were to write to the disk concurrently with this machine writing to the disk, bang, you've destroyed your file system. It's that straightforward. If you don't have cooperation when using a shared resource, the results will be catastrophic. And that's the first function of the clusterware, getting the operating systems, making them aware of each other so they'll cooperate on the shared devices. That means that each operating system becomes aware of the topology of the cluster. 
each node becomes aware of every other node. If a node starts up, joins the cluster, it will make its presence known. The other nodes will realize they have to provide access to that one. If a node leaves the cluster, maybe because it's been switched off, someone put a pickaxe through it. Again, the surviving machines have to adjust the topology. Then coming to the administration point, your clusterware has to provide high availability facilities. It needs to manage the resources, resources in this context meaning managed applications, such as databases, or it doesn't have to be databases, it could be your email server, your web server, whatever, providing high availability for these so that if one fails, it'll get restarted, possibly on a different node in the cluster. Clusterware. Oracle ships clusterware. Nowadays, it's called grid infrastructure with 11.2. I've got a couple of demonstrations, but I won't be using 11.2 grid infrastructure. Uh, that's for reasons of the machine I'm working on. It's a bit too hungry on hardware for me to run on the machine I've got here. But grid infrastructure is what it's now called, used to be called clusterware. I hate saying things are free. <laughs> so I call it a no-cost option, meaning it's bundled. You don't pay for it. Alternatively, you can buy your clusterware from a third party, and that's you know, spend your hundred thousand dollars on third-party clusterware. You will buy from Veritas or IBM or Sun or whoever it is. Third-party clusterware it may be considerably expensive. Then you need to build a storage cluster. Remember, going back a couple of slides, I'm going through. Hardware cluster, operating system cluster, storage cluster. Your storage cluster, almost certainly the hardest part to set up. You can buy a third-party cluster file system from IBM, from Veritas, whatever, and use that. Alternatively, you can now use NFS. NFS is now fully supported with a couple of provisos. Or Oracle's approved solution, ASM, Automatic Storage Management. Why would you use it? I'll give you a technical description coming up shortly. but just in terms of salesman's bullet points, fantastic performance, you don't pay for it. If your clustering standard edition, which we are proposing in this presentation, then ASM is a requirement. It isn't a technical requirement, it's a licensing requirement. Oracle will not let you cluster standard edition unless you use ASM. Um, and the fact that they insist on that is a pretty good hint that Oracle wants you to use ASM at all times rather than a third party product. Your ASM can be built on pretty much anything. LUNs presented from an EMC storage array, JBOD, a ridiculous acronym, just a bunch of disks. It can actually be disks concurrently attached to all machines. iSCSI, a very nice solution. There are a number of options. Having got the storage cluster working, at last we can build the rack. So what's the rack? Well, multiple instances connected to a shared database on disk. And now I'll come to my first little demonstration of the end result of this and how it can function. Unless any of you have any questions about the theory at this point. Question in the queue, John, is the effect on performance with Rack. And do we have to write applications specifically to run on Rack and perform on Rack? Right. Theoretically, the answer, well, I can give you the truth, or I can give you the theoretical answer. I'll give you both. The theory is that taking adjusting your applications first, the theory is that you do not need to adjust your software at all. Uh, if any of you were as old as me, if you'll remember a product called Oracle Parallel Server, and with Parallel Server, it works, but it was vitally important to adjust your application to make it aware of it. I remember a huge parallel server environment I worked on at the European Space Agency. It was about 50 odd computers sharing one database. And every line of software in that application knew about the topology of the cluster. You know, this SQL, this select had to go to that instance. This update had to go through that instance, and so on. And if they ever added or removed a node from the cluster, they had to rewrite the application. It was appalling. And Oracle's claim with Rack with 9i was that any application could be ported directly to Rack and it would run unchanged better than before. Right, that's the official story. The truth is slightly different. There are one or two issues that must be addressed when you convert to Rack. One or two, not usually showstoppers, but they do need to be addressed. And if you can make your software aware of the topology of the cluster, it will perform better. So to that question, the answer is theoretically your software needs no changes. In practice, it may need minor changes, and in practice, if you can make other changes, things will improve. Performance, 
well, I wanted time to think about that one, because Rack is often sold as a performance enhancing product, and I am deeply suspicious of that. And speaking as a technician, uh, I've worked on I've worked on one or two rack installations which were basically disastrous because the client had been sold rack as a performance enhancing product. You need to be very, very careful and work out why performance will improve. Because look at this diagram here. If you are doing, say, OLTP work, the end users, end users coming into a website or through forms or whatever, the nature of end users' work is sequential. They do this, they do that, they do something else. The fact that you've got 16 instances instead of one, their session is through one instance. It's going to make no difference at all. Where there may be a difference is if you can exploit parallel processing, but that's a huge amount of work where you do need to configure your application to the topology of it. For example, a rack we worked not so long ago is a um, telephone switch. You see millions of inserts per hour coming in as you switch the calls. And we partition the tables, of course. We're using range partitioning every hour and hash partitions within each range partition to spread the workload between each instance. And we have to build the instance number into the partitioning key to get a degree of instance affinity to certain hash partitions. So a long answer to a short question, but overall, you shouldn't need to adjust your software, but if you can, it'll help. And performance, be very careful about installing Rack as a performance enhancement product. So back to maximum availability, data guard. Right, Oracle's premium product for zero data loss is an active passive model. Previous slide, rack, both instances are open. You might have 500 sessions against the first, 500 sessions against the second. No idle hardware. With DataGuard, standard configuration, active passive. One machine is doing all the work, the other machine is purely there for fault tolerance. Once it gives you, it protects you against anything to do with the database, such as typically disk problems. It protects you against power loss because your nodes in the active passive environment can be widely separated, or separated potentially the other side of the continent. Uh, network issues because they will presumably be localized. You know, if you have one primary database perhaps in London and a physical standby in Berlin, there's no reason why a network issue should cut across it. It will therefore protect you against loss of sight. But loss of sight, let's go back to this environment here. I've got a little rack here, and my rack is, well, let me just connect system slash oracle. That's some high security for you. It's actually a bit harder than I expected. I'll even connect slash sysdba. Right. What I have here is a two node rack, and if I select my instance name and my host name from GV dollar instance, Instance. We can see that I've got one instance on a node called Rack M1 and one instance called RDB2 on a node Rack M2. So I've got my two nodes. Fault tolerant aspects of this. Within the cluster, I have extreme fault tolerance. I've set up a couple of services, and I have here, looking at the listeners, I've got a service called DSS, which I've made available on the instance RDB2, and a service called OLTP that I've made available on the instance RDB1. So if I want to connect to one of those services, connect Scott Tiger at DSS, for example. Sorry about the performance here. If Dave would pay for me to have a better laptop, I'll be able to do faster demonstrations. Now, because the DSS instance is running on RDB2, there is no question about which instance I'm connected to. I will be connected to RDB2. But then something awful happens. And let me terminate the RDB2 instance. Um, which node am I on here? It's name. Ooh, I need to go to the other one. I'll terminate the RDB instance in a reasonably dramatic fashion. Just looking at this Asmon process, which is there, and kill minus nine. So I'll terminate the instance. This is just simulating any old failure. And that instance is gone. You know, it is history. Well, what will happen to my sessions? Well, if I now log on again, SQL plus Scott Tiger at DSS. So note exactly the same connect string that I used previously. So my end users have no idea that anything has happened. Yeah, 
I have connected a Scott Tiger at DSS, and I ended up on RDB2, trying it again, assuming that the failover has indeed succeeded, I should still get another connection. Let's just check the listeners. TNS listener doesn't know the service. This, the failover takes a little time to come through. And we can see at this point this. Uh, this is my performance issue as I try to demonstrate it. So I'll come back to that in a moment. Once John? the failover comes through, you should have it. Yes, Dave? Uh, one more question in the queue at this time. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. sure you have time to address this in great detail, but what are the items that need to be or could be coded to efficiently utilize Rack in an application? It's partitioning your application to make it a... to make... Oh, there we go, failover. It's partitioning the application in such a way that different objects will be busy against different nodes. The mechanism does allow concurrent access, basically symmetrical spreading of sessions. So a thousand users splutter them randomly across the instances in the cluster. But if you can group your DSS users to connect to one or two instances and your OLTP users to connect to one or two others, which is what I've simulated here, OLTP on one, DSS on another, you will get better performance because you'll be reducing the contention between the nodes. We see here though, I think my fault tolerance will now come through if I try to connect. <clears throat> and there I are, so the same connection. My apologies for taking about 30 seconds or a minute or two to fail over. It would normally be quicker. And looking at the environment, I was on RDB2, I'm now on RDB1. And that is the magical fault tolerance of Rack, that your services to which you connect pop up on whatever nodes are available. At this stage now, because I've killed one of my instances, you'll see both DSS on RDB1 and OLTP on RDB1, that whole service, and therefore potentially all the sessions using it have failed over to the other node. Uh, sessions in progress, by the way, there are various techniques having them fail over automatically. I actually issued a reconnect. But the problem is, if I lose the entire site, I'm going to lose the lot. Because for a standard rack, your two nodes are going to be pretty close together, probably separated, or they're probably in the same machine room. That's where we come to DataGuard, because DataGuard protects against the site failure. It protects against sites because the transmission of data can be over far wider an area. The problem, however, is passive, so in principle you've got a machine doing nothing, and failover is not instantaneous. Now, but it can do more than high availability. Yes, failover, it's going to be minutes. It may even be a quarter of an hour or more. And it might be several hours, depending on how you've configured things. Now, what I'm just going to do here is terminate my, my rack to free up some memory so I can kick off the data guard environment. Let me just get that running in the background. Similar question on, on data guard, John. What's the impact on performance? Data Guard should be completely performance neutral, but if you take a lot of trouble, you can actually use Data Guard to enhance performance substantially. Uh, but that definitely requires writing your software accordingly to direct different work to different nodes. So it can do more than provide high availability. It can quite specifically provide decent performance. Now, what we'll do here is sketch out how it works. A data guard configuration, you have one primary database. That takes all the DML, and this is the critical point. All your insert, update, delete goes through one database instance, one to one database. Then we have a series of standby databases, one or more standby databases, propagate, maintained in near real time by propagating the redo. So commit a transaction, execute DML here, generate redo, redo is picked up, sent across the network, and applied to your standby database. Your most basic environment, physical standby. Your physical standby, byte for byte, identical to the primary, has one purpose and one purpose only, which is fault tolerance. Right. That will be a machine to which no one can log on. But there are options which we can then use, as yours, the question was saying, to enhance performance. We have logical standby and real-time query. The 
logical standby is so called because it contains the same rows, the same data as the primary database, but structured totally differently. And this can give you massive performance benefits. I set one up again for a telephone, it's always telephone companies, for a telephone company the other day, not, not the other day, months ago now, and the primary database, again, it was partitions with range and hash partitioning, and local indexes optimized for hammering in transactions as fast as possible, and running queries against it was an absolute disaster. Logical standby, totally different structures, same rows, but different partitioning strategy, different indexes, um, but same data, and that was where we ran the queries. Real-time query combines the two. It's a physical standby against which you run queries. Very nice capability indeed. Snapshot standby, just included that for completeness. Uh, that's a standby database that you open and then use for testing developments and then roll back to put it back into the full tolerance capacity, the full tolerant configuration. So that's a few general concepts. I've got a couple of standby database here, a first primary database and standby database, which I'll just start up now. It's SQL plus sys slash local. Right, local. Oops, I'll go to the standby. I've created a standby database called London, which I'll start up. And then I created another a primary database called RCL, and start that up too. And while they're starting up and killing performance with my computer, we'll go through a bit more theory. We'll look at streams at this point, and indeed mention Golden Gate. Streams in some respects is the highest level of fault tolerance Oracle can provide. It's an active active model. Multiple databases, multiple database and instances at multiple sites. And the sites operate completely independently. So totally independent operation. The databases are synchronized in a similar fashion to that used by DataGuard by transmitting redo across. So you log on to one instance on one database, insert data, commit a transaction. The redo of that transaction is transmitted in near real time before the commit to one or more stream databases where it is also applied and committed. And because the transmission is near real time, the databases are virtually identical. There should be no more than a couple of seconds deviation. And this gives you total independence. Because the transmission. And this gives you now total independence. The now, limitations of this, the data types. Limitations of this, the data types. The there's a limitation to do with there's user a limitation defined to do with user defined Now, when this first came in with objects. version nine, I thought now, when this first came in with version nine, I thought it was just some setting up rounds to. I'm getting an echo on the phone line, Dave. I don't think anything can be done about it. Um, <laughs> but the limitation on user defined objects is it. still there. And, but the limitation on user defined objects and is still there. It doesn't appear to be a technology limitation. Let me try and to correct that. It doesn't appear to be a technology limitation. Let me try to correct that, John. Thank you. There's, there's. Also an issue Thank that you. streams can be phenomenally There's complicated. Also to an set issue up. that streams can be phenomenally complicated to set up. But divergence, which is that if your two independent sites operate a bit too independently, typically the network between them is down for a while. You get data divergence, and then when the network connectivity comes up, you get problems because the same data might have been updated well, incompatible transactions at the different sites. Nothing else problem, because redo is transmitted in near as damn it real time. Now, there was a question about Golden Gate, which is interesting. Streams in Golden Gate, if you talk to Oracle, you're frequently told that streams is a complete dead end, and we should use Golden Gate instead. Fair enough, but Golden Gate is separately licensed, where streams is bundled with Enterprise Edition. Yeah, so Golden Gate is, is expensive. Apart from that, though, it is a reasonably good facility. Earlier release of Golden Gate were pretty poor. You know, there, there were bad performance hits because Golden Gate didn't use redo. It actually had to use normal foreground processes against the database to extract changes. But now it does use redo. Also, earlier releases couldn't do conflict resolution, whereas streams can, provided the star versions isn't too great. Uh, Golden Gate can now do uh, conflict resolution though. So it becomes a very feasible product for high availability over a wide area. Whether it's the best product, well, 
I'm not too sure, but it's a feasible option. Though it does have the issue, I believe some data type issues, and there are still the problems of data diversions. Now, let me see if my standbys have started up. I might want to start up this one now. And so my standby database is running. I'll just kick off the recovery process. Also, database recover manage standby database using current log file disconnect from session. That's almost my favorite command in the entire Oracle environment. Now, I'm logged on to my standby database. So, just see if it has actually started up. Oh, there we go. It's attempting to apply redo at this very moment. Now, if I look at some data here, if I select star from scott.depth, then if I correct my spelling, we can see that I've got all the data there in the physical standby, but if I try to do some DML, no way. You can't do DML against the standby database. That's the basic problem. Um, it isn't, in fact, active-passive, because I have opened it for queries, and that's where the performance benefits come in. If you construct your application so that queries are directed to the physical standby, you can take a huge amount of strain off the primary database. I'll just do a log switch on the primary to kick the system into action. Make sure the things really are coming through. It's doing this sort of thing on chronically underpowered machines is a bit tricky. Oh, there we go. Yes, we're applying log. We've received things through the network. And the way this should work, if I run my query here, we see my physical standby Oops, has the rows, and of course my primary also has the same row. So we've got exact synchronization. We do some DML, and we insert into Scott.depth values, and I put in department 99, which can be my new departments, and that can be over here in the UK. That DML will have gone over in near as damn it real time. Of course, I can't see it, you know, because it hasn't been committed, and that's standard protection, transaction isolation. If I commit it, in pretty much real time, hey, there it is, we see the changes come over. And this is the zero data loss, that your transactions come across in real time, and anything at all can happen to this database. You know, put a pickaxe through the server, and then I activate the standby, and I've got zero data loss. And that gives us the combination of zero data loss, and all oh, that streams topology, multiple open databases ship transactions across. That gives you what Oracle calls maximum availability. RAC gives you 100% uptime, protects you against failure of the instance, the machine, any localized failure whatsoever. Your database services survive on one or more surviving machines, and failover is automatic, and I think that's magical. Dedeguard, zero data loss, as I demonstrated, within a split second of committing a transaction one side, it's published to the other side. So what that should mean, then, is if you use Dedeguard to protect your RAC databases, you will get 100% uptime, 0% data loss. Well, yes, but there are three issues. Failover isn't instantaneous. Now, if you do have to fail over to your Dedeguarded environments, it's not going to happen instantaneously. The fastest you'll ever manage it is probably going to be 5 or 10 minutes. It's going to take a while. And for practical purposes, it's probably going to be half an hour. And believe me, it's complex, and I speak from experience there. But possibly worst of all is licensing. Now, I'm not any sort of sales droid, so anything I say about licensing, you've got to check with your well, check with someone who understands it better than I do. But this is maximum availability licensing. Dedegard needs enterprise edition. That's forty-seven to half thousand dollars per CPU. You need that at two sites, Dedegard each side. Rack, well. To give you the 100% uptime at each site, you're going to need two rack nodes per site. Right? And you pay for rack, $22,000 uplift. So your maximum availability licensing then becomes a total of four licenses plus the uplift, which I was staggered by the arithmetic, and that's why I wrote it out in numbers and then in words. What this means is that at your primary site, you'll have a two node cluster, and your standby site, a two node cluster. And that's going to be the cost. Right. Then we come to 
the, the alternative that we're promoting today, which is what is called stretch track. This is kind of the flash of how wonderful it can be. It's equivalent copy protection to DataGuard because you do end up with two copies of the database. One copy at one site, another copy is a remote site. I'll define remote shortly. This protects you against site failure that DataGuard will give you. However, unlike DataGuard, it's active active. We can do transactions against both sites, and unlike DataGuard, we have instantaneous failover. So theoretically, this gives you the benefits of both. But the best of all is the licensing, because RAC is bundled with standard edition. And the standard edition license is $17,500 per CPU. So that means that your stretched RAC giving you protection against site failover, no idle hardware, instantaneous failover, in theory comes to $35,000. Well, how on earth is this possible? Right, people did it with release 10G. I have to say I didn't. But they did it with release 10G with RAID. Now, RAID, think of a rack. This is the same diagram I had earlier of two instances on two nodes, shared storage. But I've enhanced the diagram down here a bit Instead of having one disk here, that's probably a RAID 1 ar array, set of disks mirrored to another disk. So in fact, there are two copies of the database. Right. But of course, the Oracle knows nothing about it, because the RAID software is concealing that underlying topology from what's published to the nodes up here. So as far as Oracle is concerned, it's one database on a shared disk. But in fact, it's two. And with 10G, people did this. You know, they use hardware-based mirroring to have you know, one disk array in one city, another disk array in another city, and rely on the hardware to keep the copies synchronized. But there were appalling performance issues, because Oracle had no idea what was going on. And a session logged onto this instance, the first instance, might well be trying to read data from this disk here over the other side. You know, it was, performance was abysmal. So how do we do it with 11G? We do it with ASM. I did say at the beginning of this lecture that I'd try to persuade you to use ASM. If any of you aren't familiar with ASM, I drew up an entity relationship diagram. I'm afraid being a DBA, I'm infatuated with normalization, and you can't stop me drawing entity relationship diagrams. Now, over here on the left, we've got what you're all familiar with, I'm sure. Logical storage. Table spaces contain segments. Segments consist of segment extents, which consist of oracle blocks. Table spaces physically consist of file systems. Uh, of operating system files. So at the file system level, we see the files formatted into operating system blocks. And thus we have your one logical segment cut over many files, resolved via the table space, and we resolve via the block. The ASM model, your operating system file is replaced with an ASM file. So that's a one-to-one -one relationship. What's an ASM file? Well, it exists on a disk group, a disk group consisting of multiple disks. So at this level, ASM is just a logical volume manager. We take multiple disks, chuck them into disk groups, publish the disks to the database on which we create the files. ASM files are divided into file extents, and extents are broken up into what we call allocation units. I'm not supposed to be talking about performance here, uh, but I've got a bit of time. Yes, this is where we'll find the performance of ASM is astronomical, um, because with the operating system storage, your unit of I.O. is the operating system block, or if it's RAID, it's the RAID stripe. So if it's a block, well, what's that, 16K nowadays, I expect? Even if it's RAIDed, it's probably a RAID stripe of no more than 128K. Your allocation unit, well, current recommendation, 4 megabytes. And when you convert to ASM, you'll find your units of I.O. increase astronomically. But best of all is the concept of the extent, because with the Operating system RAID, you read 128 kilobytes of data with each I.O., but there's absolutely no guarantee those 128K are all of one data file. Even if they are of one data file, there's no reason to assume that they're all of the same segments. Whereas with ASM, we map, we map the segment extent size onto the file extent size. So when you read an allocation unit of, say, 4 megabytes, you get 4 megabytes of exactly the table you want, which is where the phenomenal performance comes from. You're not wasting one byte of I.O., which you do with the file system storage model. But that's enough of the advertisement. Now, where does ASM come into stretch track? It's like this. Stretching cluster. I've taken my diagram of the physical cluster 
two instances on two nodes, shared storage. But I've extended it a bit. We have a local area network here, a local area network here. In between, we have a wide area network segment. There's my private network between the two instances. Well, I said it could be power of Ethernet cards and a crossover cable, meaning your two nodes are perhaps 50 centimeters apart. Well, what if they're 50 kilometers apart? Down here, the mirroring. Well, just two slides back, I had mirroring done by host adapters, by the hardware. And the problem, going back a couple of slides, with this is the database doesn't know what's going on. The database here has no idea that you've got a bit of data here on the right, mirrored to the left. A bit of data on the left, mirrored to the right. The database doesn't know that. It's just going to ask for a block. And it has no idea where it's going to come from. Now, with this model, ASM becomes aware of it. When we configure our ASM mirroring, we make sure that we have one complete copy of the database at this side, one complete copy of the database here. Previous slide, ASM mirroring is done at the extent level. So whenever we create a file extent on the left, we mirror it to the right. Whenever we create a file extent on the right, we mirror it to the left. And ASM is intelligent enough to guarantee that we get a mix of primary mirror file extents on both sides, and furthermore can pass that information back to the database instances. So your 500 users in New York here will always read and write their local copy. Your 500 users in, say, Jersey City, the other side of the Hudson, will always read and write their local copy. And we rely on ASM to keep them synchronized. Now, I chose said 50 kilometers here. Also, of course, 50 kilometers here. I chose 50 kilometers advisedly because Oracle claims have reference sites with this working up to 50 kilometers. Um, the theoretical limit is about 300, but I've never heard of anyone doing that. But certainly I know stretch clusters work pretty well on distances of up to 2 kilometers. That's from my own personal experience. People I've spoken to have worked over 10 to 20 kilometers. You know, so it certainly does function. Now, this is the advertisement. It's better than DataGuard because of no idle systems. So previous slide, both of these instances are working to full capacity. No delay in failover. I've said a few seconds brown out. Yeah. If you do lose one of the instances, the entire cluster will freeze for a few seconds while the surviving nodes and instances sort out what on earth has happened. So you do get a brown out, as they call it. Your sessions survive, yeah, but there may be a few seconds delay. Um, so in principle, no delay in failover. It's better than a rack because it protects things physical damage. Previous slide. These are independent copies of the database on independent hardware. Now you can lose one completely and the database survives on the other, which would not happen with rack, where you could, if you lose a site, you've lost the site. Both sites do have remote copies, local copies, sorry. It's better than streams or, or, or Golden Gate, undoubtedly, um, because there is no problem with data types. And also, it really is real-time synchronization. You don't have that delay that streams in Golden Gate will always have, um, particularly if the network has ever gone down. And the performance, of course, reads are always local, so you do get high capacity. However, there is a downtime. You can read that yourself. <laughs> right. uh, the downtime is, of course, the network. Mm, John, now, we, and in fact, we, we, we just had a question come in. What would the minimum connection link between the two sites be? OK. Well, this is what you get from the docs. Oracle documentation say you can use copper over 10 kilometers. Well, that's absolute rubbish. Uh, I don't know what the law is in America, but in England, it would actually be illegal to have copper going between buildings, something to do with how you earth your electrical supply. So copper, forget it. You have to be using fiber optics. And if you're going to be going over more than, probably more than, say, a kilometer, you're going to be using what they call dark fiber, dense wavelength division multiplexing. This is, I made a slight mistake when I drew up this slide I just noticed. I've said it's an OSI physical layer protocol. In fact, DWDM comes to layer higher up. Theoretically, you can use existing cabling, provided it's fiber optic, and you can layer DWDM on top of it. But this is not going to be the sort of network you'll get if you just telephone, you know, if you just call your local telephone provider and ask for an ADSL line. Yeah, this is not going to be good enough. It's going to have to be a dedicated line running. It's going to need to be 
mm, one gigahertz is going to be the absolute minimum, uh, ideally two gigahertz. So it's not going to be cheap. But you should be able to use existing cabling. The sites I've worked on this with this pulled through, set up their own cabling. One was an airport and building a new terminal that had the opportunity to drop new cabling in between the old terminal and the new. Um, the other sites worked on not so recently was um, our hospital in Holland and they owned the entire city square. So again, there was a tunnel going underneath the square. They could pull their own fiber optics through. Uh, but there's no reason why you shouldn't get a dedicated line from your local telecom provider. You know, it'll be, what's it, T1 lines, probably two or three T1 lines mixed together, multiplexed together, and run UDWM or equivalent over that. So the network is going to be a problem. But provided you've got the network, you, know, you get the ability to do this. And what does it give you? 100% uptime, zero data loss. The cost savings can be phenomenal. Remember my figures, $280,000 down to perhaps $37,000 to an extreme system. There's no idle systems, instantaneous failover, wide area connection. Your application, we had a question about that. Yes, this should be completely transparent to the application because anything to do with RAC theoretically is transparent to the application. Performance should be excellent. Right. Now I'm going to pass back to Dave, who will go through a couple of more things, and then I hope if there are any questions, we can deal with them. And thank you for listening to me.